Mary Ann Gilbert, 1776 to 1845. Mary Ann Gilbert, or Mags as we like to call her, was born in Eastbourne in 1776. Actually, it was the Old Town area. Eastbourne was made up of four hamlets, Bourne, now Old Town, Meads, Southbourne near the Town Hall, and Sea Houses, which was a fishing settlement east of the pier. There were no flushing toilets or internet. People were dying young from cholera, smallpox and tuberculosis. You were lucky to reach your fifth birthday. Quite frankly, it was rancid and smelly. Many landowners grew rich and used their influence on government to create laws which enabled them to get richer whilst the poor got poorer and poorer. Farm workers rioted, demanding better wages to support their families. Max was against these practices and decided to use her inherited land and property to help the poor. She not only believed that useful work would redeem the poor, but also if the poor could support themselves through productive work, this would ease the burden of the Parish Poor Relief Fund. Employing the poor, she inherited the wasteland at Beachy Head, Whitbread Hollow, and put it into cultivation. She taught them how to use a spade rather than a plough, and they successfully produced a healthy crop of potatoes. From then on, they were keen to rent strips of land to grow their own crops. It was a pioneering move and a start of allotments as we know them today. By 1832, nearly 200 families rented allotments, growing mainly mangle wurzels, turnips and potatoes. Some were even keeping cows and pigs, and they all had managed to pay their rent through their own hard work. Mags experimented with seaweed and liquid manure for fertilisers. She also introduced water butts to preserve water and invented a water filtering system. Many of the rich did not believe or did not want to believe the poor could support themselves and they were losing their cheap labour to work on their own lands. Max wrote many papers and letters with calculations proving the success of this project. It had literally halved the number of poor in the area relying on help from the parish. She even opened agricultural colleges and schools. Allotments today still follow many of Mary Ann's methods. When Mary Ann died in 1845, she was recognised as a pioneer in helping the poor out of poverty. If Max was alive today, what do you think she would be doing now? How about an agricultural scientist working on research to alleviate world hunger? Or an advisor for the United Nations Special Organisation for Food and Agriculture? Marie Corbett, 1859 to 1932. Marie scandalised her neighbours by riding a bicycle and showing her ankles. But then shocking her neighbours wasn't unusual for Marie. She was an ardent feminist and rebelled against her social class who believed the poor to be dirt under their feet, something that could be kicked aside. For Marie, the poor needed help and she would do that through social action, helping them with their housing and emotional needs whilst her husband helped with any legal issues. In 1887, annoyed with the lack of progress in getting the vote, she formed the Liberal Women's Suffrage Society, along with others such as Millicent Fawcett. She was met with hostility from the disapproving crowds she drew. When women were finally allowed to stand at local elections, she scandalised her neighbours again and became a borough councillor. But it was the workhouses that were the true scandal, and the worst of these, beyond worst, was Eastbourne Workhouse. It was famous for its cruelty, and Marie wasn't having any of that. Her sense of justice meant she had to do something. So she did. She rescued the children by finding homes for them, paying the new parents five shillings, 25p, a week for each child, the equivalent of £16.50 in today's money. It was the beginning of foster care as we know it. She had up to 100 children in her care and made sure they went to the dentist and read all their school reports. She was making sure they had a future. If Marie was alive today, what do you think she would be doing now? A leader, certainly, and perhaps a spokesperson for shelter, maybe the UK director for Save the Children, or head of the Adoption and Fostering Academy. Emily Phipps, 1865 to 1943. Emily was a short woman, but big in ideas. She was known for her sparkling personality, wit, and very strong tongue. She wouldn't suffer fools gladly and had strong opinions about the levels of injustice in the UK. She was very political and did not want to be listed on a public census in 1911. 
She hid in a cave on the Gower Peninsula with colleagues and lifelong friend Clara Neal so she wouldn't be counted. She continually challenged the status quo and certainly lived by her motto, If you make yourself a doormat, do not be surprised if people tread on you. She started life as a school teacher and became a headmistress of an infant school attached to Homerton College in Cambridge. She moved to Devon to gain promotion to headship of a higher grade school and gained a first class degree in 1895. Promotion called again and she moved to Swansea to become head of the Municipal Secondary Girls School which she transformed turning it into one of the best in Wales. Her social conscience was never far away and she became an active member of the National Union of Women Teachers. She inspired so many teachers that in 1915 she became its president for three years. Emily was the first editor of the NUWT journal, a Woman Teacher. Not for her columns on fashion and cookery, no, she made sure it was forthright and political. The 1918 general election was the first in which women could both vote and stand as candidates and Emily stood as parliamentary candidate for Chelsea. She was defeated, but unlike the other 16 women who stood, she retained her deposit in a straight contest with the sitting Conservative MP, Sir Samuel Hoare. She soon turned her campaigning energies elsewhere, and while still a head teacher, studied for the bar in the evenings and was admitted as a barrister in 1925. There followed a career in law in London, and then when ill health forced her to retire, came to Eastbourne to live with her friend Adelaide Jones. If Emily was alive today, what do you think she would be doing now? Certainly a politician and perhaps the Minister for Education. Another career could be as an international speaker on women's rights or as an editor of a leading newspaper. Lady Emily Shackleton, 1868 to 1936. Emily was born to a large wealthy family in Sydenham, Kent. She was born in an era where it was considered unsuitable for a woman of her class to work and so she was destined to be wife, mother and homemaker. Emily met her husband Ernest Shackleton in 1897 on his return from an expedition to the South Pole and they married. Emily spent much of her time alone with the children whilst Ernest was off on expeditions or lectures. There was no telephone or ship radio, so news would only come via land telegraph or letters many months after the event. It was Emily's charm and connections which helped to raise the funds for the expeditions, but also in preventing the family becoming destitute. Ernest had a tendency to give the money he was paid for lectures to good causes, forgetting his family. Thankfully, Emily's annual allowance looked after the family, but she didn't encourage the fairy tale of women living happily ever after in marriage. They lived at 14 Milthorpe Road, Eastbourne. Ernest would moor his boat off the pier before he went away on expedition. During World War I, attitudes changed towards women. This was because with so many men away fighting, women had to step into their jobs. Women had the chance to show what they were capable of. On her own yet again, Emily made a life for herself joining the new Girl Scout movement. At first the guides were seen as controversial as people thought it encouraged girls to join the women's suffrage demonstrations. But when it had the support of the royal family, who Emily was good friends with, the guide movement became acceptable in polite society. Emily became the Eastbourne Divisional Commissioner and continued being an active member of the Guides even after her husband died on his last expedition, leaving his family in debt to the tune of 1.5 million in today's money and reliant on charity. If Emily was alive today, what do you think she would be doing now? How about head of fundraising for the RNLI, a diplomat? Or perhaps she really wanted to be an explorer herself and would be off making new discoveries in the Arctic or the jungle. Elsie Bowerman, 1889-1973 Elsie was born in Tunbridge Wells into a wealthy family. They then lived in St Leonard's, but her father died when she was only five years old. She inherited enough money and property that she did not have to work. Despite this, the family lived frugally and were careful with their money. In 1901, aged 11, 
Elsie was the youngest at the prestigious girls' boarding school Wickham Abbey and gained first place in her form, showing the intelligence and spirit that was to carry her through the rest of her life. She went to Girton College, Cambridge to study medieval and modern languages, although women weren't allowed to have degrees then. Whilst there she became a suffragette, her mother was also very active in the movement alongside the Pankhursts. In 1912, Elsie and her mother travelled to USA to visit family. They happened to be on the RMS Titanic, which as we know was sunk by an iceberg. Elsie and her mother were amongst the few to survive. Rather than cut their trip short, they decided to continue with their visit. World War I broke out in 1914 and the suffrage movement paused their campaigning to focus on supporting the war effort. Elsie went off to the Russian front with the Scottish Women's Hospitals. She received the certificate of the Russian Medal for Meritorious Service. World War I marked social change throughout Europe and Russia, with many lower classes rebelling against inequality. In the UK, this led to the success of the suffrage movement in some women having the vote and being able to enter Parliament. The Sex Disqualification Act in 1919 allowed women to enter professional careers that had been previously barred. This is when Elsie studied to become a lawyer and she was called to the bar in 1924, becoming one of the first groups of women to become barristers and appeared at the Old Bailey when she won a libel action brought by the National Union of Seamen against a communist. Elsie went on to have a varied career. In 1946 helped set up the United Nations Commissions of the Status of Women. She came to Eastbourne and continued campaigning and supporting causes. She felt, though, that the 1960s feminist movement betrayed women like her who had fought for equality with its focus on sexual freedom, and she died of a stroke in 1973. What would Elsie be doing now in our time? Probably choosing the same career, perhaps entering law earlier and becoming a judge, or perhaps she would be a politician and maybe the Home Secretary or even the Justice Secretary. Jessie Blackburn, 1894 to 1995. Jessie was born on the 20th of April, 1894, in Cradley, Worcestershire, to a wealthy family. On a visit to a friend in Paris, Jessie, aged 18, met her husband, Robert Blackburn. Robert was an aviation engineer who started the Blackburn Aeroplane Company. Jessie and Robert married a few months after World War I started. During the wedding reception, a telegram came from the Admiralty to request warplanes. They spent their wedding night travelling to London to meet with Winston Churchill. On marrying, Jessie received her inheritance, which she used to build and develop the company, which today is under the ownership of British Aerospace. Jessie learnt to fly soon after marriage, but there were no pilot's clothes for women. She had to learn in a heavy woolen riding dress. She was the first woman to fly a monoplane and took part in the prestigious two-day, over a thousand miles King's Cup air races in 1922 and 1928. With her vivacious personality, Jessie became a valued ambassador for the business. Her home became the place to be for people like Sir Winston Churchill, Amy Johnson, Lord Northcliffe, Louise Bluriot and Sir Sefton Branker. She acted as head of marketing on all the trips abroad as her husband Robert didn't like meeting new people. He was happier doing the engineering. Jessie moved to Eastbourne in the 1960s celebrating her 100th birthday at the Grand Hotel. If Jessie was alive today, what do you think she would be doing now? Perhaps a fighter pilot or astronaut or the chief executive of British Aerospace.